Okay, welcome everyone. So I want to let you know that I finally got the Monday lecture uploaded. I'm going to show you where to find that. I'm going to show you where to find in the dreams, in the Chasing Broadway Dreams in the Heights. And I will show you the announcements thing before we get into the lecture for today. So let me just do that right now. And where was I? Hmm, I just had you guys up there and now I can't find it. I will be going, ah, here we go. Okay, are you, what are you guys seeing? Are you seeing me or you're seeing my screen? Anybody? Or are you gonna, you're gonna just do you. Just me, okay. All right, let me go now and see if I can do this because I've made it just big. Thank you for doing a verbal. Huh, because I am, oh, here we go. I was just not reading my screen correctly. It comes up as tiny little posted stamps, right? Okay, so I'm first gonna show you how to reach these modules. Okay, there's your first assignment and please submit it. If you haven't submitted it yet, just submit it. There's no late charges, no late points removed this week. I just want everybody to get up to speed and get used to this whole new system. And this is in the, this is the discussion in the Heights. So here, if you go to the group discussion, you'll find the video and you find the discussion prompt so that you can post and get your 20 points here. And that's a graded assignment and I'll, it will come to me uh, in the grade book. And then this is where I put the most salient things about um, what's happening and new things that happen. So today there is free food here on the campus. So if you're in Santa Barbara, and I know you, some, a lot of you may not be, but you may have this where you are in a campus. We always have a food pantry. We have a clothing pantry called um, Tiffany's Closet. We have a lot of other things at Santa Barbara City College. But, and even you guys who are enrolled, you can also do mental health because you are enrolled and it, it's all telehealth right now. And I know I need that and I take advantage of all kinds of things that we have. But today, 2.30 to 4.30 West Campus parking lot, which is actually, I'm gonna show you where that is. Um, you can just drive by and they put it in your trunk. So that's kind of a great thing. Also, this was for Bailey. She asked for, um, a link, here's the bookstore, here's where you can get the book. This is directly to the textbook, exactly takes you to the page where you can order the textbook. I did a Google search for Mari on the Pocket Full of Plays, which is a book that I mentioned uh, that had three of the plays in it, should you prefer to read it in a hard copy rather than online. So any questions about those quick announcements? Just thank you. Yeah, of course. All righty. I'm going to stop the share. Okay, uh, it's 9.15 and I'm gonna go straight into the lecture then so that we can talk about this origin of theater and then we'll take a little break like we did before and we will go to Broadway and producers of, on Broadway. So I have had experience in all kinds of things and we'll have some fun doing this. I discovered that I don't have to edit all of the transcription of the video. Yay, because that was like about 10 hours of work. And I know now how to get it onto YouTube and then it will go populate into your module. Oh, that was the other thing I was gonna show you. You can find it in there. It says um, introduction to TA 103 in Canvas. So you can click on that. That is the Monday lecture. And it will be captioned if you take it to YouTube and it will be, I've selected it to be captioned so that you get that. Okie doke, questions on that? I'm so excited that it can be there. So this one I can get up today now that I understand the process better. And I know some of you said Canvas is new for you and this whole thing is very new for me. You know, as a costume designer, I work with real stuff. 
you know, I work with three dimensional bodies. I work with clothing on bodies and this, all this virtual stuff is and mysterious for me. So I'm, I'm learning along with you. Just have to embrace the adventure. Let's go right to origin. I now have to go to a different screen. <laughs> yeah, Pam, I thought I had this completely ready. So let's see, is it this one? That, sorry if it's so, I mean, this is so boring, but let me, let me undo this share and see. Okay, I'm not gonna, hmm. Like, I'm not sure why it's not on my share thing because I can actually see it on my screen, on my desktop. Maybe I can do desktop and maybe I can find it that way. Oh, sorry, then I have to double click on here. That's what I need to do. I'm sorry, I'm really just not so adept at this, but I'll get better. All right, everybody should be seeing the Google slide here. Is that right? Are you guys all seeing? Sorry. Yeah, thank you so much. It's awesome. Okay. And let me see if I can get it full screen. If it's not full screen, here we go. Okay. <clears throat> I didn't want to do that. I want to move this over. We're, I'm sorry. We're just gonna you're gonna have to limp along with me because I am now gonna have to get it centered in my screen. There we go. And let me just move this over and then we can go to full screen. Thank you for your patience, everyone. Okay, that looks better. All right, this is where I think theater begins. It starts with people, even sometimes before language, trying to explain their life. How much information can you get from this picture? What did we do today? What are we gonna to do tomorrow? How are we, what are we seeing? You know, we're seeing something that possibly is, is mastodon. We're seeing something, you know, with big horns, some sort of buffalo type thing. We're seeing making of food and we're seeing how to communicate who I am. Who am I? Look at this outline. Look at my hand. Look at what I saw. Look at what I'm making. So I feel like the origin of theater, and this is a little bit different than your book. I mean, they really put it down to the Greeks, but I think it really does start with caveman and ancient civilizations, as we just saw, use storytelling to celebrate and educate. Celebrate their accomplishments of the hunt, celebrate their accomplishments of birth, death, life journey, and educate, who are we? We're trying to find out who we are. We're trying to find out, that's odd. We're trying to find out who is going to come next and where are we going? As a human being, we are the subject of the theater. And it's this, it's this duplicity that we share as the, both the subject of the theater and the one doing the storytelling. Theater is the most immediate way of experiencing the human condition because you have an actor, and we know as an audience member that that is an actor who is actually portraying a character. That creates immediacy and presence as distinguished from other art forms, such as passive art forms, or works that are on a wall, sculpture, the plastic forms that are even architecture because it is the interaction between a live actor who's portraying another character and the audience who's not a passive observer looking at the actor, recognizing it's an actor and 
going along with the character. What is the immediacy of theater? Both actors and audience are essential for theater to take place. Theater requires that the two of them come together in a special place. So they have to come together in a special place. And this is gonna take us to an assignment next week about finding an alternative theater space. Theater engages the audience in a cons construction of meaning of the human and spirit experience, meaning we're trying to figure out what is this human experience? What are we doing here? What, why, how can we make sense of man? Man is so bizarre, so complex. Our interactions are so complex. If you ever wondered why is that person doing that and why am I doing something? So this is a way to try and create meaning behind all of this. The individual, the relationships, the journey from birth through all of the ages to death, and really trying to make sense of who we are. Immediacy is theater's defining characteristic. This is the thing that separates theater from all other art forms, as I said before. It engages us in the active physical construction of behavior and meaning. So both the actor and the audience are sharing at the same time in this creating a structure of behavior and meaning. We see actors acting out parts, and we see this whole world unfold in front of us. It can't be replicated in any other medium. It's not like a movie. It's not like a novel. It's not reading a picture book. And once it ends, it's gone forever. You can see a play many times, but you can never see it the same way because you're bringing everything that you brought to the theater that day and the actors bringing everything they bring. It's a very interesting thing to work on a play and see a play for 14 performances. We generally do at least 14 performances. By the time we get to the opening night though, I have already seen three dress rehearsals, two previews, a run through, a crew view. So I've seen it probably close to seven times. And each time from the beginning when it's very rough and, and sort of herky jerky, you're wondering, is this ever gonna make sense? Are we ever gonna get a story? Until finally, after even sometimes after opening night when the story becomes seamless for the audience and it's really there and at the end sometimes you savor the moment wishing it could go on and knowing that once it ends it's gone forever it's alive theater parallels life the stories of theater parallel life stories actors tell a story to an audience and the audience experiences the story at the same time as the actor tells it the actor is portraying the character, the relationships of the character, that unfolds in front of the audience's eyes, and the audience is seeing it as it's coming to life for the audience the very first time, for the actor representing hours and hours of rehearsal to get to that point. This is an important word. Theater is effinescent, and that's a great thing lasting only as long as the performance. So when the curtain goes up, and a lot of shows don't even have curtain now, but when the performance starts, you're experiencing the moment of theater. And then when the lights go down, the audience leaves the theater, that moment is over. It's parallel to the society that produced it. And when you go to different countries to see different kinds of theater, it will reflect that society. So if you are from another culture, you will be seeing things that are produced in Santa Barbara that will not be as familiar to you. So you guys can uh, unmute for a second and I'm just gonna stop share so we can talk about this idea 
of that experience of when does the moment of theater start? When do we actually start that experience of going to the theater? What do you guys think? You should unmute and we can have a brief word discussion. Personally, I feel like a lot of people think that theater begins once the play starts in right. rehearsals, but I think it starts before then, before the pre-production, before the tech, like just the idea of people coming together and wanting to perform something and yeah. share something. Yeah, thank you. Very, very, very good viewpoint. Anybody else? Just take a stab. Everyone has a different opinion on this. Well, I think what's interesting is that uh, the same script can be performed by a, a many different theater groups. And because of that, the story can be told in many different ways. And so I feel like there's different levels to it. Like the, the actual show itself, yes, like started with the per first person thinking like, hmm, this is a good idea for a play. But I think even deeper than that, it's each individual group who performs it starts their own performance, like their own per interpretation. Yes, yeah, their own interpretation or that, that thing that we talk about, that basic construction is individual for the group of people who have made the commitment to perform that story. Mm -hmm. Anybody else, when does the performance start? Have, if you've been to see a play, when does a performance start? Or even if you go to a movie, when does that performance start? Although, see, a movie is different because every time you see a movie, the movie is going to be the same. You might be different, and you'll bring a different set of experiences there, but the movie is going to be the same. And that's where theater is different and why it's alive and more immediate, because theater is different every time because live people are doing it. Anybody else want to share? I'm just gonna put something out there and say, maybe it starts the moment you decide to go to theater. What do you think about that? The moment you make that decision as an audience member, and just because we're talking about two things here, we're talking about the theater, and then we're talking about the audience. The performer, the audience. The performer may have been working on this for several weeks. The audience member may have bought their tickets several weeks ago. And then they're anticipating going to the theater. So once they anticipate, then they're going to go to the theater, right? So let's, um, let's make sure that we are thinking about both sides at the same time the performer, the production team, the group that's performing the piece, and the audience. What happens to the audience? We're gonna talk about this a little later, but you know, think about it, they bought their ticket. How easy was that? How easy was it to buy your ticket? Now you can buy them online. You know, We have a number of people that still drive up, go to the box office, they wanna buy a physical ticket. They pick it up, they pay their money. That's when they start their experience, their theatrical experience. How about parking? Okay, we've got the night. It used to be that you dressed up to go to the theater, but who cares? You're wearing your you know, surf shorts and your Hawaiian shirt and you're going to the theater. How easy it to, is it to park? How much does that influence your experience in the theater? And then think about walking into the theater. So let's um, continue on, because this is really a discussion for when we talk about audience, but I want you to try and think about both things. Okay, so it is alive. It is lasting only as long as the performance with the audience who experiences it at the same time, and it's parallel to the society that produced the play. Oh, let's see, how am I advancing it? Dang it. I thought that did it. Okay. So double, double, doubleness, there's this, this replication of two. Actors are themselves human 
playing another human. And actually, sometimes they play animals. Sometimes they play inanimate objects. We had a play this spring called The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime, and it just a phenomenal play about a, about a young man with some challenges trying to make it through life and his experience. But in that, the actors at sometimes played a table, sometimes played a bed, sometimes played, you know, all people inside of a subway, sometimes actually playing a rat, a milkshake machine, you know. So the actor is a human playing another human usually, but sometimes playing even an inanimate object or, a, or an animal. The audience experiences both the actor as the performer and as the character played by the actor. And they have to be willing to look at both sides. The stage is just a platform. Whatever it is, it, that creates another world. That's just the way that we look at where the performance is. And this is part of that special place. It is a reflection of life that teaches us about our humanity. Think about that for a minute. Have you ever gone to a play or a movie and then afterwards, or I used to do this reading a book, and you just can't get the idea out of your mind? And the next day you're still thinking about it? And you can even have thought that maybe it wasn't very good, but it just is sticking in your mind. And that's because of this this point right here, it somehow is a reflection of your life and it's touched you and it's teaching you about your humanity in some way. So I think that's a, it's just such an amazing thing that we as a community of human beings can learn from each other by listening. Oh, let's see, why am I going backwards here? Wait, I'm going this way now. There we go. Theater's fictions. So it's really let's pretend. It is a fictional enactment of stories, of events, and people. Even if it's a real story, an actual event that took place, and you're portraying a character that was really there. For example, there is um, a wonderful musical called Mm, shoot, I'm just, name is escaping me right now, but I think it's something like Far Away or Far Away Home. And it's the story of the plane that was redirected from landing in New York and ended up in Nova Scotia during 9-11. And the town was so small that actually the number of people on the plane was equal to the town. And it's the story of how, oh, Fly Away Home, that's what it's called. And it's the story of how they took care of those people during that very tense time, and actually a time that many people have equated to what's happening now with the pandemic, is this whole feeling of chaos and uncertainty and, and questioning our very existence and our life. So it's still, though, Fly Away Home. It's just a few actors a few chairs and they portray the entire story that way but it's still a fictional enactment of a real story so think about the difference there as opposed to a made-up story also valid stories are organized intentionally to pull the audience emotionally and intellectually into the character's life so the story is organized from beginning to end to create this emotional attachment in the audience and then to have them respond intellectually and then have an ending for that story. One, uh, two years ago, I did South Pacific with Rubicon Theater, which is a professional theater. We had 28 people in the cast. It's a story of World War II on a South Pacific island. And we got through, the, it, was, it was a very beautiful production. I'll try and find some pictures to show you. But the, um, I'm gonna make a note of that just a second so that I can remember to do that. If I don't write it down, I'll forget. So 
we went through the, all of the rehearsals. It was, it was a very beautiful production in a very small theater with only 200 seats. It sold out. They extended it. It sold out. You know, it was fantastic. And, but at the, at the preview, the producer came in and she said, I think we need to change the curtain call because we're not getting the audience emotional response. There's not a big enough payoff for the show. And so then they tried something and we were there for another hour and it was like, not quite right. So they tried it that night. That's what previews are for. Previews are generally a cheaper ticket. And we'll talk about that when we talk about Broadway and producing, but uh, so they tried the, the new curtain call staging that night. And that night after the performance, everyone stayed again. And the producer said, we're not quite there. So we had a meeting the next day at two o'clock prior to the show so that they could work on this, how we can get the audience completely engaged at the end so that there's a payoff for watching the show. So, and then she changed it again and it was amazing. And the audience was truly on their feet at the end of the show. And that was, that was a really rich experience for me because I never had somebody come in at the, after previews and say, we need to make it this kind of a change, this dramatic of a change. And it was, it was because they really wanted to pull the audience emotionally and intellectually into the story and also have them have a great resolution for that. Theater's illusions. Now, when you get your book and you read your book, chapter one, it's, this will all be in detail in there, but theater creates an illusion that we are sharing an experience with the others for very first time. So when you're sitting in an audience, you have never sat in that chair at that time next to those people watching that play before. Every time you come, it'll be a different person sitting next to you and the actor's energy will be different. So always it creates an illusion that we're sharing experience with others for the first time. And we are. For the performance, the audience willingly suspends disbelief and shares with the actor the illusion that what we are experiencing is real. So the audience is willing to go along with it, completely forget themselves, go completely into the story and say, I'm with you. I'm experiencing this at the same time you are as you're telling me as the character, this story, I'm with you, I'm on your journey. And when you walk into the theater, you agree to that. What is the theater space? What is the space that we talked about where the actor and the audience meet this special location? It is a place for the act of seeing and being seen. So as an audience member, you are seeing the actor and the actor is being seen by the audience member and vice versa. So the actor sees the audience, they see the reaction from the audience and the audience knows that they're being watched. So there's a very interesting, again, double dynamic that goes back and forth between actor and audience. The theater space is from the Greek word theatron, which is a seeing place. That's how it's translated into a seeing place. The theater is a seeing place. It's the use of space to imitate the human experience in front of an audience, not from the architecture, meaning not from the playhouse, not from the kind of stage you're on, not from a fantastic um, proscenium arch or from a black box theater. It is whatever's happening in the space to imitate the human experience in front of an audience. The architecture in which the story takes place can affect the story if it's a very, very big theater, and I'm gonna show you some pictures of Santa Barbara City College Theater. It's a, it can affect it. Sometimes the architecture is drawn into the visual storytelling of 
the play. And that certainly happened within the Heights. And you saw that when they brought in the model of, this, of the set design, and then when it was installed in the theater. The actor plus the audience plus the space equals a theatrical performance. All you need is an actor, an audience, and a space in which to play. Thespis is the name of the first actor. And he became the first actor when he stepped out of the chorus and created dialogue. And we'll see that when we read Oedipus, because Oedipus has a choral mode in it's in three sections. And we'll talk about that when we debrief Oedipus next week. The vital ingredient, again, is the actor audience relationship. Who are the theater's audience? It's a specific group of people assembled for a special occasion. Everybody had to make a choice to go see the, the play on that specific time, that specific day, in that specific theater. So in a way, that's their unifying factor. Everyone who's there, whether they are known to each other or not, decided. In the same way that you would decide to get a ticket to go to a football game. If you have season tickets for the Dodgers, you're gonna to get to know the person that has season tickets next to you because you've all agreed that you're gonna go see a certain number of plays, 60, play, 60 um, games in the Dodger Stadium. So same thing with a play, except it's only one time. So you're, you may have a season ticket. We sell season tickets for Santa Barbara City College for the theater group. We'll talk about that when we talk about producing. What is a season ticket? So you may actually sit next to the same person each time for the five performances, or you may not. The final essential participant in the creation of the theatrical event is the audience. No matter how much you rehearse, how much you perform, you have a beautiful set design, you have gorgeous costumes. Without an audience, you don't have a theatrical event. Audience expect plays to be related to life experiences. So they kind of, because we're talking about the human condition. So they expect something familiar. It's shaped by a previous experience, but they're ready for a new one. Um, appreciation, their appreciation is enriched by their own life experience. So if there's some character that they can specifically relate to, they may enjoy that play more. And good theater provides a sense of new possibilities. And that's that thing about reflecting life and your own story. So that's a really fun thing that we can do. The audience is central to the theatrical event. The audience experiences theater as a collective response. So think about this. You bought your ticket, you've come into the theater, there's a lobby, and you know what I think I'll do now that I'm realizing this, I will go video the lobby of Santa Barbara City College so that you can see what that looks like. We have two theaters and I'll just take, I'll take a video of what you would do as an audience member to come in and how you would enter into the audience space. Generally you come in, there will be some lighting, but it's usually subdued, particularly from daylight if you're seeing a matinee. And then you may or may not see something on stage. This idea of collective response comes from the story unfolding at exactly the same time live for every single person in the audience. So each member is a co-creator of the performance. If you hear people laughing, you're much more likely to laugh. If you hear people crying, a something exciting happens, a big intake of breath. <sighs> Collectively, it's like, whoa, or something scary. Everyone feels that. And so the audience has a collective response. And then that goes to the actor and the actor also takes energy from that. So there's an energy exchange back and forth from the house, which is where the audience sits, to the stage. And that's the co-creator portion of the performance. Active participants, the audience is an active participant in cultural, 
and social and political issues that are set forth in the play, generally reflecting either something they know or something that they want to find out about. Uh, the audience shares, sorry, I'm, I really live in an industrial area. The audience shares in defining the global village. So we can go to anywhere in the world. Let's see what we have. Let's go to the theater arts department at Santa Barbara City College first. Here's our website. You can go to that anytime. This is a play called Games Afoot. And what's something that you notice about this that you may not realize that would be different from what you might have experienced at your school? Anybody want to venture forth something here? Just they all have the same color scheme. They all have the same color scheme. Well, does that maybe tell you, what does that tell you? Well, I think that the color that a character wears can tell you, tell the audience a lot about the character and like help shape their perception of the character. Sure. So, so if they're all wearing the same color. That means that they all have something like similar about themselves. What could be similar and, and the color that they're wearing is most people have a touch of red. What could be similar? What might red indicate? Um... Well, I would have to see the play, but it could indicate, uh, I mean, power maybe, or if they're all, maybe they're all a member of the same family, or I don't know what it would represent in that specific show. Mm -hmm. but. And so they're all kind of wearing uh, formal clothes as opposed to they're not wearing pajamas and they're not wearing casual wear. So what kind of event is taking place, do you think? Anybody? A awesome. formal event, and they definitely, they could be of like just higher, wealthier class as well. Sure, yeah. Actually, that's a very, that's exactly right. They are, there are some fam, familial relationships here. That obviously, these two in the middle are a couple. These two are a couple, and this man is describing something. So that's good. Anything else we can get from this picture? Do you think, do you think of a holiday that represent that red can represent? Anybody have that? Uh, idea? Christmas, like the holiday Christmas season. Right. It is. This is a Christmas Eve. Actually, I think this is a. It's either Christmas Eve or New Year's Eve taking place in this very moment. All right. So that's what else do you notice about the individuals? that are playing the characters. Let's talk about them. Do they look like college kids? Well, two of them do. Two of them do, okay. The two in the middle seem more like college kids. This one, the girl is a college kid. This, this guy is a, is a fairly recent graduate. And how old do we think? Who's the next older person, do you think? Uh. The, the guy holding the letter, maybe? I don't know. Okay, so here's another person, and he's significantly older, right? Like plus 20, 30 years. I think actually this gentleman in the plaid vest is plus 20, and this gentleman in the red smoking jacket is plus 30. So one thing I wanted to point out about Santa Barbara Theater, theater Arts at the community college level is anyone can audition. Any community member and can audition and be cast and all casting is age appropriate. So unlike a university or a college where you casting only from your college student acting pool, the acting pool at Santa Barbara City College is the entire community. We do have people that come from Ventura, Santa Maria, Ojai. Those are places that are 50 to 70 miles away and audition. And so we, because we cast age appropriately. We have student awards. Here's some that got for today. You can sign on to Theater Arts. This is embedded in the lecture, so you'll see it, and Ben can talk to you about, Ben's our tech director, standing in front of a set. He can talk to you about the theater program. And then each of our things, acting, design, and transfer. 
These are, this picture under transfer has masks. These masks were worn by the characters um, in Sense and Sensibility called the Gossips. And the Gossips were representing the um, society members that were commenting on the action that's happening in the scene. And these were made by the design class. This is, an, this is in the makeup room. The, this is a class that I teach. And then this is in, uh, this was an original play that we did and each story was told, when the story was told, they stood up on the box. You can see the box. So every actor had a different silhouette, but the color scheme was identical. So it's very beautiful. And we can look at our production. You can see some gallery. We'll take a couple looks at the pictures here so you can see what we have. Just take a, there's our spelling bee. I showed a picture of spelling bee in our, um, in our course syllabus. This is noises off. Again, you see our age range here. This is the same woman who was in the white silver sparkle dress. So you can see how well she camouflages. And this is that, uh, a different image of, of, um, oh, I think it was called love. And that's the play that you saw in the opening caption. Sent, this is a picture from Sense and Sensibility, which we did last fall. All, this is an all student production. This gentleman is here, even though he seems older, and this woman seems older, but they are actually full-time City College students. All these pictures are taken at a dress rehearsal. So um, I'm always looking at things like, is the costume really as finished as I want? I'm seeing a hem showing and is the hair and are the wigs right? And so, but uh, this is in our small theater called the Jerkowitz Theater. It is a black box theater. This is Lifeboat, uh, the last Lifeboat. Again, this is also in exactly the same theater, the black box theater with great use of projection in the back to, this is a trial scene and you can see in a 1910 period, you see all of the audience behind, quote, in a projection. This is the Garvin stage, a production of Greece. Again, the Jerkowitz Theater, you can see how versatile it is. This is Crimes of the Heart, the um, a Pulitzer Prize winning play by Beth Henley. The Garvin Theater again with High Society, where we have a number of servants as well as our leads standing out beautifully in their red dresses. And you can see this is the orchestra in the background. We actually, they actually became visible for part of this performance. This is a musical that we did last summer called How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying. These are two-dimensional sinks that flew down from the fly system, and they're standing behind them, imitating the washroom at a corporate entity. So I wanted you to just see a few things like that, and we're gonna go to, now, those were from the theater arts department, and we're gonna see a few things from the theater group. This is what the community theater component of Santa Barbara City College looks like. When we do a big musical, this is the Grease picture again. It is involving all community. This is Harvey. You can see the Garvin Theater. One Man, Two Governors, again, the Garvin Theater. It's, and this is the production we just saw, Games Afoot. So you can see that we have a really beautiful playing space. It can very, very versatile and can accommodate a straight play such as Harvey or done in the 30s, a play done in the 60s with a band, a play done in 19, I don't know, 30, and Music Man from 1890s. And I'll, when we get back to Music Man, the thing that was interesting about that was we had this idea that the, the, the town itself, I don't know if I can stop this, let's see. The town itself was, yeah, I can't, was all in beige until they got touched by the music man when they started becoming very alive. So 
I'm going to stop share. And I thought that would just give you a tiny taste of what we offer here at Santa Barbara City College, along with this is the audience and the performer relationship that we have. Um, any questions? Yes, that's right, Come From Away. That's the name of that beautiful play that is from uh, about the 9-11. The, um, so it's a, a great thing. And we can get some images of that. It'll be very interesting. No questions? Nothing. How big is the audience in the main theater? Like how many seats? Yeah, it's almost 400 seats. Wow. And the audience is on a rake, which means it is, it goes, the stage is here and the audience goes up at a level. So every single, every single seat is very, very visible to, um, it, the uh, stage is very visible from every single seat. There, it's in two sections. There's an upper section and a lower section, completely, um, accessible for anyone in any kind of disability. Also, our particular theater, and I would take you on a tour of our theater, is accessible if you were, for example, somehow physically impaired and you needed to have a wheelchair, you could still hang lights in our particular facility because we have an elevator that can go to the top of the, of the fly system and you can take and hang lights from there. You can be a stage manager, you can do anything on stage. We've had certainly actors in wheelchairs on stage and backstage. So we're open to everything. Uh, any other questions? The black box theater is about 109 seats. So it's about a quarter of the size of the Garvin. And we'll talk about theater spaces next time so you'll know exactly what we're talking about. The Garvin is the traditional proscenium stage where you're looking through a picture frame like a television that has actually you see the people behind the screen and the black box is where you're in the same space as the actor so very very immediate okay we're about to 10 o'clock let's take a 10 minute and we'll be back at 10 08 okay so just take everybody can stand up and wiggle around for a minute think if you have any questions and we're going to talk about producing plays See you at 10.08. Bye. Thank you.